Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting live on July 25th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Today, we're going to get a law professor's take on several Florida stories in the news, and that includes updates about the criminal cases against former President Trump. And I'd like to hear what you think about it. If you want to email us at dj at wmnf.org, or you can text 813-433-0885. Joining us right now by Zoom live is Chara torres Spellacy, a professor of law at Stetson University College of Law in Gulfport. Chara torres Spellacy is also a Brennan Center fellow. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad you could come on and uh, we can inform our listeners about what's going on in the legal world. And a lot of what we'll talk about this, this hour, as I mentioned, are the various indictments against Donald Trump. But uh, soon we'll turn to that. Let's talk right now about voting rights. Um, one of the voting rights uh, issues that's come up in the last few days is that in 2018, voters in Florida approved a constitutional amendment that allowed most felons to who had served their terms to regain their voting rights. But in 2019, the Florida legislature stepped in to kind of... Um, maybe they say clarify what voters had had uh, written into the Florida Constitution. But what happened in 2019 when it came to felons and the fines that they needed to pay before they voted? Yes. So Amendment 4, which was passed in 2018, restored voting rights. Uh, but then the Florida legislature swooped in in 2019 and said that individuals had to pay fees and fines before they could get their voting rights restored. This led one federal judge to call this a pay to vote scheme. But ultimately, uh, what Florida did in 2019 was upheld by the federal courts. So now we have a new lawsuit which asks Florida to produce a database which makes it clear how many fees and fines are outstanding for any individual citizen. And this is a key reform that we need because right now, uh, Florida is very Kafka-esque. Uh, it won't tell you what fees and fines you owe, but if you guess wrong and vote, then they will go after you for fraudulent voting. And we saw that when there were about 20 people arrested roughly a year ago in Florida, and uh, a lot of them said that they just thought they were eligible to vote, but they weren't sure. And so you think a database like this might clarify things? Indeed. I, I write about this in my new book, The Democracy Litmus Test. And a lot of those original 20 arrests, the prosecutions have fallen apart, in, in part because uh, lots of these individuals had voting rights cards from the state of Florida, which said that they had the right to vote. Then they voted and then they were prosecuted for voting. And one of the things that their lawyers were able to say is, they didn't have uh, the mental state of voting fraudulently. They thought it was lawful for them to vote. And one of the reasons they were uh, arrested is because Florida has this new office called the Office of Election Crimes and Security. Critics are calling it the Elections Police. What is this? Um, what does this office do? And the two point six million dollars that that the Florida legislature has given it over the last two years. What kind of 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 crimes, I guess, is this office going after? So they're looking for individuals who have voted illegally. Uh, and that is not the worst thing in the world. We want our elections to be safe and secure and for those who are eligible to vote to be able to vote. But the problem that Florida has created is they haven't made it clear what fees and fines uh, someone with a felony conviction actually owes. And so they are just creating this system which puts an enormous amount of risk on the would-be voter, uh, and it is incredibly punitive. So if you guess wrong and vote when you're not allowed to vote because there's some outstanding fee, fee or fine that you don't even know exists, then you can be prosecuted for that unlawful vote. Critics of all of these uh, things that have happened since 2018 say, well, one of the goals of the Florida legislature is for fewer and fewer people, especially people who might lean Democratic, to be able to vote. 
that's and and be allowed to and be able to register and and to vote but there's also kind of a corollary here that seems to have happened especially maybe in the last election the 2020 um 2022 election is that there are a lot of people maybe sitting it out because they're kind of afraid that they've registered but they're not sure if they're going to get busted if they do uh, vote yeah i think this is going to have a chilling effect especially for those individuals whose rights were restored by Amendment 4. They may have a zero balance on their fees and fines, but there is no database that Florida runs where you can actually establish that you have a zero balance. And that's why they're being sued. Uh, Florida needs to create a, a streamlined one-stop shop where anyone can figure out who owes what. And when you get to a zero balance, that's when you can vote. So you've made the argument for why the state needs something like this, but now we're going to look at, you know, what are, I'll ask you, what do you think the chances of that actually happening, happening like a judge or however it would work, would say this is needed, but it, I also have the authority to kind of ask the state to do this? I think uh, judges are going to be very sympathetic to this, um, as in, I think they will require Florida to make such a, a database. One, it's sort of nuts that Florida can't keep track of the fees and fines that are owed to it. That just seems fiscally unprudent. Um, but it's also impacting people's fundamental rights here. If you can't prove that you have a zero balance, that will deter individuals, even if they do have a zero balance, from voting. And that changes who the electorate is. Our guest is Chara torres Spellacy, professor of law at Stetson University College of Law, and we're talking about a range of legal issues that impact Florida this hour. Later on, we're going to talk about the indictments that are facing former President Trump. I'm Sean Canan, and this is Tuesday Cafe, and we're coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Uh, I'll ask you briefly maybe about a different election law that just came out of this Florida legislature this year. It's called SB 7050. It passed in, in early July. A federal judge blocked parts of it that were challenged by voter registration groups. They The uh, parts that were blocked would prevent non-U.S. citizens from collecting or handling voter registration applications and make it a felony for voter registration group workers to keep personal information of voters. Uh, what are your thoughts about this law and about how it might uh, be what um, upheld in the courts? So this uh, is getting at sort of another um, overblown uh, accusation of a problem that's not really a problem. So the accusation from some Republicans is that there's a vote harvesting problem. So vote harvesting, the pejorative term for this, could also be known as helping one's neighbors. So there are lots of different times where you would want to help a neighbor vote. For example, they are in a nursing home or are otherwise ill or homebound. Uh, in order to get their ballot back to the state, it may be very difficult for someone to even get down to their driveway and put their ballot into their mailbox, mailbox for a return trip to the state. And so over the years, um, there have been voting rights groups who you know, go to nursing homes or other places where people are struggling with exercising the right to vote, and they have helped them to vote. Uh, and get their ballots in and, you know, comply with all of the rules, sign all of the places you're supposed to sign, things like that. Now, uh, for certain Republicans, they find this abhorrent, which I find very strange, but they, they do not like the idea of voters being assisted in voting. And there is a sort of minuscule risk of fraud. So, you could have someone who went to, say, a nursing home and gathered up um, all the absentee ballots from all the nursing home patients and voted the way they wanted to vote, not the way the voter wanted to vote. But these things tend to get caught. So one of the things that election workers will look for is, are there lots of ballots from a similar location all in the same handwriting? And those get flagged for potential fraud and investigated. So I, I feel like the, the fear of vote harvesting is quite overblown. 
Um, and the idea of a non-citizen handling a ballot being like the end of the world, I, I think that sort of ignores that we have lots of families in the United States and in Florida who have a um, a non-citizen parent, for example, and an American citizen child. Uh, that American citizen child, once they reach the age of 18, is allowed to vote. So having the non-citizen parent, you know, handle the, the ballot on behalf of um, their, their teenager who is a voter does not seem like the end of the world to me. But um, there seems to be this move in lots of red states, and I would sort of count Florida in that at this point, uh, to criminalize vote harvesting. So they're criminalizing helping another person vote. And I, I think that is sort of very wrongheaded. And regardless of how this case uh, th that's challenging this law ends up, it looks like it's already having an effect as far as um, impacting voter registration groups. This is something I saw on the social media network that was formerly called Twitter. I saw this yesterday. The League of Women Voters of Florida said, due to the new law and ongoing legal battles, League of Women Voters of Florida has decided to switch to electronic registration to avoid penalties associated with paper applications. That's a quote from, or here's a quote from the league's Cecile Schoon, who says, we strive to follow the law even when it seems unfair. So even, uh, let's say this law is eventually struck down or whatever happens, regardless of the outcome, it's already impacting people who, groups who go out and, and try to register voters. The other frustrating thing about this is Florida has done this before. So Florida has made it nearly impossible for voter registration groups to register voters in Florida. Uh, and it's inevitably challenged and Florida has either lost or settled those cases. So they basically stop the law that, um, you know, made it so hard for voter registration groups like the League of Women Voters, which is why if you um, are a law nerd, if you look up the League of Women Voters of Florida, you will find that they have been plaintiffs in lots of lawsuits against Florida and that they've won lots of lawsuits against Florida because Florida has this bad habit of trying to make it more difficult to lawfully register to vote. And one of the ways they do that is they just make it completely impossible for the voting rights groups like the League of Women Voters uh, to help people get registered, which is sort of like another version of trying to make it more difficult to vote because Florida is a state where you have to pre-register in order to vote. You have to plan ahead. Uh, you can't just show up on election day and register the same day. And that is different from other states. Other states are much more pro-voter. Uh, there are same day registration states where if the uh, you know the fancy strikes you, you finally get interested in an election in the last few days that uh, the election is open, you can register to vote in those states. Um, and other states, um, around ten of them, have gone to automatic voter registration. So in those states, the presumption is you are registered to vote. The presumption in Florida is that you are not registered to vote and that you have to take affirmative steps to actually register. So our democracy is um, a patchwork. Part of that is rooted in federalism. Each of the 50 states gets to have their own election laws. But it means that if you came here from uh, California, for example, which has automatic voter registration, and you think that you are automatically registered to vote in Florida, I have bad news for you. You are not. Um, in Florida, you have to take affirmative steps to become a voter. And Florida keeps doing this sort of ridiculous game of making it really hard for civil groups, civic groups, to help you register to vote. So it takes a little bit of initiative on the part of the voter here. You know, we've talked a couple of times so far about laws that that Florida, the Florida legislature passes, the Florida governor signs, and that are eventually overturned by the courts. And all that expense is paid for by the taxpayer. Is there any 
disincentive for the legislature, you know, to do that? Is there any is there any reason for them to stop doing that? I mean, it would be nice. I think I think it's fair to say I, that if we stopped passing laws that are going to get overturned and then stopped uh, having to defend those laws in court, it would just save everybody a whole bunch of time, a whole bunch of confusion, and a lot of money. Are there any things in place that might incentivize stop to stop doing that? Unfortunately, not. Um, so there are such better uses of our taxpayer dollars. Um, we could put it into improving our schools, improving our roads, dealing with climate change, uh, you know, drop job training programs. There are a, a lot of different things that this money could go towards. And instead, we have decided, or at least the legislature in Tallahassee has decided, and Governor Ron DeSantis seems to agree, that um, passing laws, some of which are, end up being ruled unconstitutional, either by state judges or by federal judges, uh, they are spending the, our time and money and, and, and resources to um, you know, sort of tilted windmills, um, the fear of vote harvesting, the fear of someone being assisted in registering to vote. These are not things that I think should be at all criminalized, but uh, we have this sort of anti-voter culture in Florida. And so the, the legislature has decided that this is the way that they are going to use valuable and rare resources. Our guest is Chara Torres Spellacy, a professor of law at Stetson University College of Law. And we're talking about a range of legal issues this hour, including we're going to turn now to talk about some of the indictments that are facing former President Donald Trump. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we'll we'll break down these different indictments against Trump and the possible ones to come. So let's begin with the first one that happened. It was a case in New York, and a former president is facing. What is the former president facing there? I should say in New York, and what will be the consequences if he's actually found guilty? So in New York, this is uh, something that came out of the 2016 election. So in, in 2016, uh, Trump is running for president for the first time. One of his lawyers um, named Michael Cohen works with the National Enquirer to um, what is known as catch and kill bad stories about Trump. So uh, Cohen, with the help of the National Enquirer, uh, catches and kills uh, negative stories from two women who uh, claim to have had affairs with Trump, and then some doorman who claims that Trump has some illegitimate child. And both of, or all three of those stories um, don't make it to the light of day before the 2016 election. Now, this um, required payments from Trump through Michael Cohen to these two women in the doorman. Um, some of that is, is facilitated through the National Enquirer. Some of that is facilitated through an LLC that Cohen creates. It all gets a little complicated, but the long and the short of it is uh, the Trump organization books this as sort of normal legal fees instead of a hush payment scheme. And that makes the Trump organization's uh, business records uh, illegal. And so Trump is being charged with uh, falsifying these business records. And uh, if he's convicted, he could spend several years in prison. What's so strange about all of this is uh, there's nothing in our constitution that bars Trump from running for president just because he's convicted of a felony. So there could there is this prospect of the possibility that we could have a person elected to the presidency from jail. Um, and we've never had anything like this. We are in completely uncharted waters here. And just to add a little bit more about the charges, 
this was um, one of the hush payments was supposed to be toward Storm uh, Por Stormy Daniels, who's a porn star, and it's a 34 felony count uh, indictment. So there's a you know a lot of um, serious charges. And one point about this that's happened recently in the news is that last week a federal judge denied the Trump team's attempt to move the Manhattan-based charges into federal court. And it is rep, it's been remanded to state court. So why is it important here that this is a state charge versus a federal charge? So this all goes to presidential pardon power. Uh, the president, um, like right now, Joe Biden, if he wants to pardon someone for a federal crime, he can. Uh, but President Biden cannot pardon someone for a state crime. So it matters whether Trump is charged federally or in uh, a state proceeding, which is what the New York um, DA's case is. It's considered a state proceeding. It's sort of a local proceeding, but it, it's considered state, not federal. And that matters because if he is convicted, then no president, including himself, can pardon Trump for that New York state crime. Uh, and it would have been different if, his attempt to remove this to federal court had worked because if he could argue that this was actually a, a federal crime that he should be charged federally for what happened in new york then uh either trump himself could try the self-pardon which is another thing we've never seen before but if anyone was going to try it it would probably be this individual uh or say uh, Ron DeSantis wins the, the nomination and then wins the presidency, it's not out of uh, question that a Republican president would pardon Trump for all of his federal crimes. But so long as he has a state conviction, that state conviction cannot be pardoned by any president. Our guest is Chara torres Spellacy, professor of law at Stetson University College of Law, and we're talking about legal issues that impact Florida today. Some of the indictments facing former President Trump, that's what we'll be talking about as well. And so we've already mentioned the first one, the state charges in New York State. And now we'll talk about the federal case against Trump in Florida. He was accused of, he was indicted for keeping classified documents at Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach. And since this one is based in Florida and it's fairly recent, it might be the one that's the most fresh in people's minds. So what what are the 30 or some of the 37 counts here that Trump is charged with? So he is essentially being charged with mishandling classified and military documents. Uh, these are documents that belong to the United States. They do not belong to Donald Trump sort of full stop. Uh, and he's been strangely arguing in the press that the presidential record act somehow gives these documents to him it does not it does the exact opposite uh it, it makes clear that these documents that you know were created during his presidency are the property of the of the united states and at the end of his presidency he was required to give them all back instead of instead of giving them all back, apparently he absconded with boxes and boxes of them. And then he stashed them, it, it appears, at, at his home in Florida at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, now, the story gets very strange from there. The, the National Archives, who has the responsibility for these documents, I think first asked nicely for them back. Uh, asked several times, and uh, Trump and his lawyers gave back a few, but not all of them. Then he becomes um, subject to a federal subpoena to give them back, and uh, he doesn't give them all back. Uh, he even hides them from one of his lawyers, uh, and uh, apparently this lawyer was taking copious notes. Maybe the lawyer had a sense that he was being lied to. And so all of this is led to Mar-a-Lago being um, searched. The, the search turns up the, the missing documents, at least most of them. 
And so now he is being charged with um, maintaining these uh, classified and military secrets that he had no legal right to um, retain. And according to CBS News, um, the documents include information about U.S. nuclear programs, defense and weapons capabilities of the U.S. and other countries, vulnerabilities of the U.S. and its allies to attack, and how the U.S. would retaliate in response to an attack. You know, it seems, I don't know, it seems like why in the world would a, an ex-president think that that's information that they should just keep lying around, not under lock and key? Um, it, it's uh, you know, some people have gone out on a limb and said that he wanted to trade some of this information for favors. Um, you know, I don't know if any of that's in the indictment, but uh, it's, it sounds like it's very serious charges and isn't just because there's always the talk about this will being a political uh, ploy and, and uh, it's Democrats trying to nail a Republican. But it seems like that we're really talking about serious federal crimes. We are. Uh, and the indictment doesn't accuse him of selling any of these documents, um, at least not yet. Uh, it's also, it's possible that there could be a superseding indictment if there's evidence of that additional crime. Uh, one of the things that the indictment does uh, accuse uh, Trump of doing is sharing documents uh, that are either classified or contain military secrets with people who had no authorization to see them. So there was an individual who was writing a book about um, Mark Meadows. That individual is shown some documents. Uh, there's CNN has now released a, a tape of that meeting, which is pretty damning, um, where Trump appears to be showing these sensitive documents to individuals in a room none of whom have the authority to see such a document. And then there's a further accusation that um, one of the heads of his PAC uh, also was shown um, a map that the, the map <laughs> seer did not have authority to see the map. So there are uh, serious problems here with having an ex-president retain these sensitive documents and then not um, protect them in the way that we would hope a classified document or a document about U.S. military secrets would be kept. The most recent news perhaps on this indictment has to do with the timing of the trial and the Trump team was hoping to get the trial pushed back till after the 2024 general election in November of 2024. The prosecutors wanted to try it earlier, and there was kind of a maybe a compromise in time from that from the a judge in the, this court, Eileen Cannon, whose name we'll hear, I'm sure, over the next few months a lot. She set the trial date for May 20th of 2024. So this is after the Florida um, uh, primary election, but before the general election. So it looks very likely, and maybe you can tell me the chances of this date being moved, but it looks very, very probable that this second indictment will be tried before the general election of 2024. Yeah, so the Trump team um, had a very aggressive ask uh, to Judge Cannon. They essentially asked for a indefinite postponement of his criminal trial around the classified documents. Uh, and essentially, it, between that and statements that Trump has made um, in the public, he seemed to be arguing that he wanted the trial to go after the 2024 election. And this goes back to our previous discussion about the pardon power. So I think the logic of this would be, um, though it, it's still pretty bizarre and out there, is that if he won the presidency in 2024, then uh, because of a longstanding memo at DOJ, it says that a sitting president cannot be indicted. And so if he made it all the way to January 20th of 2025, and he was assuming the presidency, then 
all of the federal criminal indictments against him would have to be paused for four years during his presidency. Um, and or <laughs> he might try to pardon himself for all of these alleged crimes. Now, we've never had any president try to self-pardon, but uh, I think that would be a really difficult thing for the courts to deal with. So usually the courts are very hesitant to deal with presidential powers that are sort of clearly laid out in the US Constitution. And that is where presidents get their pardoning power. It is one of the things that is uh, enumerated in the US Constitution. Now, I think this would be a corrupt use of the pardoning power, but the courts are really hesitant to opine on such things. And so it is entirely possible that if Trump tried to self-pardon, that a court wouldn't stop him. Our guest is Chara torres Pelosi, professor of law at Stetson University College of Law in Gulfport. And we're talking about legal issues in Florida, including the indictments facing former President Trump. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we are turning now from the indictments that have come down. There have been two. And the next we'll talk about are indictments that might happen based on the information we have. And the first one is about a federal indictment that's possible related to the January 6th insurrection and Trump's uh, um, attempting to derail the transfer of presidential power after the 2020 election. We don't know that there's one coming, but Trump has said he's gotten a letter from the special counsel who said that he's a target. And that's a strong signal that uh, it's that Jack Smith is moving toward a grand jury indictment of the former president. In order to indict, the grand jury would have to find probable cause that Trump broke the law. So what what possible um, breaches of the law might Trump have made in this case? There are so many potential crimes here. This, I think, is the big enchilada um, with Jack Smith looking at Trump's role leading up to January 6th and then on January 6th itself. So the reason why I say there are so many potential crimes is there were sort of like crime after crime after crime between the January, um, between January 6th and the previous election in November. So one of the things that they are likely looking at is this effort to pressure states, um, governors, uh, elections officials to either reject votes for Joe Biden or manufacture votes for Donald Trump. Uh, the clearest example of this is in Georgia, where we've all heard the tape, where Trump asks for a specific number of votes to be manufactured on his behalf. And the pr precise number that he gives is one vote more than Joe Biden got in the state of Georgia. Now, fortunately, I think for all of us, the Georgia officials number one, didn't manufacture votes for him. And then number two, they released that tape publicly so that the entire world could hear it. So that is going to be uh, probably a crime in and of itself. Now that may be prosecuted locally by Fannie Willis, who's also looking at uh, Trump's crimes in Georgia, but it could also be folded into the Jack Smith um, investigation as well. Then there are the fake electors. So in many of the swing states where if you if Trump had sort of run the table on all the swing states, that would have given him enough electoral college votes to actually assume the, the presidency. Uh, out of those um, states, individuals who would have been his electors had he won those states, uh, strangely went along with this fake elector scheme. So in several of these states, these electors sort of pretended that they their team had won that state, um, which is completely fraudulent. Uh, and they put in um, sort of fake certificates that sort of 
asserted that they were the true electors. And uh, that was used as an excuse by some of the lawyers who were around Trump during this period, like John Eastman, that the uh, electoral count on January 6th either should be stopped or should be paused or sent back to the states for reconsideration. And all of those individuals who participated in that fake elector scheme, I think are facing some legal liability. Um, at the very least, they are likely to have violated uh, 18 USC uh, 1001, which makes it a crime to lie in a, an official filing with the government. So at the bare minimum, there's the sort of lying to the government problem. But it's also a criminal conspiracy to overthrow the 2020 election. And I think that's where you get um, Jack Smith being interested in the fake electors. Then there's what's ha what happened on January 6th, um, which a lot of us watched in real time. You have um, Trump talking to um, a riled up crowd, a crowd that we now know he knew uh, was armed, not the entire crowd, but individuals in the crowd were armed. And then he encourages them to go to the US Capitol where the constitutionally required electoral count is taking place. And the crowd listens to him, they do as instructed, they attack the Capitol, they attack um, police officers and law enforcement at the Capitol, they injure several um, individuals in doing so, they break into um, the Senate chamber, they break into this, the Speaker of the House's office, uh, they create mayhem um, and in so doing, they delay the Electoral Count Act for several hours. And all of that uh, exhortation to um, you know, go to the Capitol may be something that Jack Smith charges as incitement to an insurrection. Now, we don't know because we don't have, um, number one, he hasn't charged anything yet in, in this part of the, the, the investigation. So we don't know what he's going to charge. And what I am hopeful of is that he will do a sort of similar speaking indictment as he did in Mar-a-Lago. In Mar-a-Lago, he really laid out like, Here's, here are the documents, here's Trump moving them, here's Trump hiding them from his lawyer. Um, it was a really rich narrative. And so I hope that he does a similar thing with uh, whatever he's about to charge around either the you know pressuring state elected officials to change vote counts, the fake electors, or the violence on January 6th. So it's really understandable to the American public why these are crimes, why they're serious, why they are deserving of prosecution. And I read in CNN that in contrast to Trump's voter conspiracy theories that the president, when he was president, he met with senior officials in February 2020. He was touting the security of elections. Do you think that that detail might matter where, where in 2020, Trump was saying how secure the elections were. And, and then after the election, he had all these consp conspiracy uh, theories that he was peddling. Yeah. Um, so it all depends on what um, crimes Trump is charged with. But one of the factors that uh, the special counsel must be anticipating is, you know, what what defenses are the Trump or his lawyer is likely to raise. And one of the um things that he might raise is, I truly believe that there was fraud in the election. Uh, now, this matters for certain crimes and doesn't matter so much for others. But um, if you are charging, for example, uh, so one of the things that came out in the January 6th Select Committee, their reporting, was that uh, the Trump campaign after the 2020 election 
raised money for a election defense fund uh, and you know, basically to pay the lawyers who would litigate cases about the 2020 election. And it turns out that this fund does not exist. And so another crime that he might be charged with is wire fraud uh, for raising money for a purpose that did, did not exist, uh, which is basically defrauding people out of their you know, harder dollars for you know, a fantasy. Now, in such a crime, it might really matter whether you could prove that Trump knew his um, big lie about the 2020 election, that it was stolen, uh, whether he knew that was true or false. If he knows that it's a lie and he's fundraising off of that lie, then that would, I think, encourage the special prosecutor to go after that mail fraud charge around the campaign finance um, crimes. Uh, but if he doesn't think that he can prove that to a jury, he might not charge that crime. Even if the crime is otherwise sort of uh, perfectly um, self-evident because he's raising money for something that doesn't exist. On the other hand, when um, if the crime that he charges is interfering with a meeting of Congress, which is what happened on January 6th, they were meeting for a constitutionally required counting of the Electoral College votes. That does not require him to know whether the fraud claim that he has about the 2020 election is true or false. You're not allowed to interrupt a session of Congress, whether it's for a sort of cockamamie reason or, you know, a sincerely felt reason. You're not allowed to interrupt um, a proceeding of Congress. And if he's charged with that crime, it doesn't matter whether he believes the big lie or not. Our guest is Chara torres Pelosi, a professor of law at Stetson University College of Law, and we're talking about legal issues in Florida, including some of the indictments that have faced or might be faced by former President Trump. And this is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. One of the things you talked about earlier was Trump's uh, contacts with elections officials in Georgia. And The Guardian is writing that th there will be charges related to statutes related to influencing witnesses and computer trespass in the state of Georgia, including Trump's conversations with Georgia's Secretary of State that you mentioned earlier, in which uh, Trump asked Ra Brad Raffensperger to find 11,780 votes. So um, I, I what tell us about double jeopardy here. What happens if those uh, around the same time he's indicted in Georgia, but also indicted on these federal uh, charges that you were talking about a moment ago? It would it be a problem for the prosecutors if if this this Georgia information is is mentioned in both cases? So as a constitutional law professor, that question makes me so happy. OK, so the reason why it makes me happy is no one ever asks about double jeopardy, but it's a really good question. Um, so under our system of federalism, we have a federal government and then we have the governments of each of the 50 states. And the federal government gets to have laws that cover federal crimes. Each of the 50 states gets to have their own state crimes. And the double jeopardy is when you're charged um, for the same crime twice, which if you're the federal government, you can't charge someone, have them be acquitted, and then charge them for the exact same crime like two days later. That's double jeopardy. However, um, because of our system of federalism, you can be charged by both the federal and state governments for essentially the same action. So, for example, if you vote twice in a uh, in, a, in an election. That is both a federal crime and a state crime. And the federal government can go after you for voting twice, and the state government can go after you for voting twice. And that isn't considered double jeopardy because of federalism. The federal government is its own sovereign, and say it's the state of Florida, the state of Florida is a separate sovereign. This is sometimes known as our system of dual sovereignty. 
And so if you were sort of uh, criminal enough to vote twice in a particular election, you were risking double prosecution, prosecution at the federal level, if it was in a federal election, and then uh, at the state level, if it's in a state election. So if we bring this back to Georgia, it's possible that the, the same actions in Georgia could violate federal law because you're interfering with a federal election, but it could also violate Georgia statutes because you are um, interfering with the Secretary of State of Georgia and his responsibilities. So you can be charged both state and federally from essentially doing a one action if that one action violates both state and federal law. And going back to the state charges potentially in Georgia, according to The Guardian, the people that they spoke with, that it, the indictment of Trump in, for state charges in Georgia will be a, what they call a sprawling racketeering indictment related to influencing witnesses and computer trespass. And in order to do so, the prosecutors will need to show the existence of enterprise. So maybe you can help define some words there. What is enterprise and what is racketeering? So racketeering uh, comes from the prosecution of uh, the mob, uh, otherwise known as the mafia. And the idea with racketeering is that you have a criminal enterprise. So think of the mafia as the criminal enterprise. And the mafia may be up to several crimes at once. And so in order to make sure that you're able to prosecute like maybe all seven crimes that a particular mafia family has done, you charge them under RICO. Uh, and I think that this is a, a similar approach, if the reporting in The Guardian is correct, that uh, the prosecutors in Georgia may be looking at. Because if you think about uh, the Trump campaign or Trump himself and their actions in Georgia, it wasn't just one thing. Um, at least in the press, it looks like there was an attempt to get into certain Georgia voting machines. There was the attempt to pressure the Secretary of State to manufacture votes. There's the fake elections, uh, electors scheme in Georgia as well. And so sort of similar to um, a prosecutor who's trying to get all of the crimes that a mob boss or a mafia family is has done, you use RICO and and RICO is um, at the federal level. Uh, it's the federal racketeering crime. Uh, but lots of states have what are sometimes known as little Ricos, and Georgia is one of the states that has a little Rico. Uh, and it, it may be this uh, statute is what uh, Fannie Willis will use to go after Trump. Now, what I think is going to be really interesting is, does she only go after Trump? Because he didn't do this alone. And part of um, if you're going to charge someone with RICO, it essentially has to be a conspiracy. So you're going to need other participants in the scheme. And so one thing to keep an eye on is uh, Senator Lin Lindsey Graham. Uh, so he also apparently called Georgia officials during this time and, and pressured them to um, either change the outcome of the Georgia election in 2020. So he may be facing some, some criminal liability depending on how ambitious uh, that prosecutor is. And then there are individuals like Cleta Mich Mitchell. So Cleta Mitchell, was a lawyer on the Trump team. And uh, she was apparently on that infamous call where Trump asks for the extra votes. Uh, she already had to leave her law firm. Her law firm was quite disturbed at her behavior in that call. And I think one of the open questions here is, is she going to face any criminal liability from Fonnie Willis in this Georgia case, this RICO case? Um, or will the focus solely be on Trump and maybe people we don't know as well? Um, and, and, and we shall see. Our guest is Chara torres Spellacy, professor of law at Stetson University College of Law. And we're talking about legal issues in Florida 
and some of the indictments that are facing or might face former President Donald Trump. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And I think that in the remaining four or five minutes that we have, I want to talk about redistricting. The Supreme Court recently ruled that Alabama needed to redraw its congressional map because it only had one minority majority district. And that was the court found that that was in violation of Federal Voting Rights Act. So how might that ruling impact Florida's redistricting that just happened last year? Yes. Um, so Florida, I think, was counting on Alabama to win that case, and they didn't. It was, I think, a pleasant surprise for voting rights advocates. But the Supreme Court both upheld the Voting Rights Act again and said that Alabama had violated it by having only one uh, majority minority district instead of two. So in uh, Florida, there was um, a lot of what I would call shenanigans around uh, the map that was created after the 2020 census. So there are, I think, strong arguments that it violated the Florida Constitution under the fair maps um, provision of the Florida Constitution. And then I think there are also really strong arguments that uh, the Florida maps violate the Voting Rights Act, too, in the same way that the Alabama map was just found to violate the Voting Rights Act. So I think that loss um, by Alabama at the Supreme Court could have huge reverberations for maps in Florida, because it it keeps a door open for litigators to make um, an argument that what Florida did with that post-2020 map um, was not legally appropriate. And let's remind people what happened last year in Florida. The Florida legislature, which is dominated by Republicans, drew maps, and yet they still had this extra, well, compared to now, they had this this uh, North Florida district that looked like if if uh, voters got would that voters would get to choose their representatives and that it might be a, a black representative who would, was voted in. But then when the governor got that map, he vetoed it and sent his own map back to the Florida legislature. And uh, they kind of rubber stamped it after he vetoed their their first map. So um, is the the order that that happened, it, does that, do you think that that'll play into any kind of legal challenges that happen with the map? Um, it's always hard to say what a particular judge will fixate on, um, but it's not the greatest set of facts if you are arguing that a map was created in the ordinary course. Uh, and I, I think the map that was created after the 2020 census in Florida has real legal problems. Now, the good thing is after this loss um, at the Supreme Court by Alabama, civil rights lawyers, voting rights lawyers can uh, still go into court and litigate these matters. And hopefully at the end of that litigation, you get um, Florida to draw maps that are fairer to all voters. And that was supposed to be what happened in Alabama, but in Alabama, um, you know, they came out with essentially pretty close to the same map and the Supreme Court might end up eventually having to uh, have a special master draw new lines for Alabama. Speculation about whether that might happen and what might happen in Florida in, if that if we get to the same point. Yeah, it's entirely possible. I don't think that Alabama is going to have um, a good um, path legally because they were just told by the Supreme Court to stop misbehaving and they're still misbehaving. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Professor Chara torres Spellacy. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you could come on. Chara torres Spellacy is a professor at Stetson University College of Law in Gulfport. And we had an audience member, Twinkle, saying that uh, she enjoyed having you on the show today and learned, she learned so much, could listen to you all day long. So thank you for that note. And if you missed this interview, you can also watch it beginning this afternoon on our website, WMNF.org. I want to thank our phone screener, DJ Spaceship. You've been listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. 
During this time slot tomorrow, Shelly Reback will host Midpoint, and she'll talk about malaria in Florida. Coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom. Their guest is the founder of a nonprofit working to save manatees by restoring seagrass beds in Florida. This has been Tuesday Cafe coming to you live on July 25th. Thanks so much for listening to WMNF Tampa.